All right, so in this chapter, we've already done um, oxygen-based nucleophiles and sulfur-based nucleophiles and nitrogen-based nucleophiles, and we've seen derivatives of those nucleophilic attacks like the Wolf-Kishner reduction, reduction using rainy nickel. This whole week, we're going to switch gears and talk about slightly different nucleophiles. These are usually considered irreversible nucleophiles. So in the case we saw with alcohols and nitrogen, those are reversible reactions. There are some nucleophiles that just simply are not reversible. So hydrogen is a good example of this. Let's say I've got an aldehyde, and I want hydrogen to act as a nucleophile in order to give us an alcohol. What reagent will I need? Let's choose the most gentle reagent. Yeah, sodium borohydride. And typically you do this in some sort of alcohol solvent. And we already covered this reaction. It's weird to think of it as a hydrogen nucleophile, but it is, right? It's a hydride attacking that carbonyl. You guys are right. Instead of using sodium borohydride, you can use LAH. But if I'm a chemist, why would I prefer to use sodium borohydride? It's maybe safer. What's the other thing with LAH? It's a two-step reaction, right? LAH, you can't use an alcohol solvent because it's a strong base, where sodium borohydride is really gentle. So most chemists would prefer using sodium borohydride. All right, if we want to do the same thing with a ketone... It's easily done. We can add in a hydride, again using sodium borohydride and methanol or any other alcohol for that matter. And it works really well. It's a clean reaction. One downside to these, especially the bottom one, is you lose your stereochemistry. That hydride can attack from either the top face of the carbonyl or the bottom face. So you usually end up with a, a scrambled stereo center. Just for review, we've seen this work with esters and carboxylic acids, too. Both of these can be converted to alcohols, but will sodium borohydride cut the mustard anymore? Too no, too gentle. Too so we use lithium aluminum hydride. And we usually have to use excess in order to drive this reaction to completion. And then step two, we need to protonate it. So we'll add in some sort of weak acid or even water it will work. So it's a really straightforward reaction. We're not going to go through the mechanism, but just basically treat it as H minus attacking it, right? It's really easy. The second reaction that we're going to cover, we've also seen. So this will be review. What if we want to have carbon attack in instead of hydride? Grignard reagents. So carbon nucleophiles, Grignard reagents are an awesome one. What's that? Yeah, they are irreversible. And we'll get into that in a second. So let's say I want to add in just a generic Grignard. How do I prepare my Grignard reagent? So let's say I've got this group down here, and it's got a bromine on it. How can I turn this into a Grignard reagent again? Elemental yeah, you need elemental magnesium. It will insert in, and now you've got your Grignard reagent. That's a good thing to remember for your synthesis problems. At this point, you can add in your Grignard reagent. No problem. Again, you kind of lose stereochemical control. The Grignard can attack from the top face or the bottom. But this leads me to my next question is, why is this reaction irreversible? So for example, why can't I just clamp down and do that? Because the magnesium, or the, the magnesium bromide fell off, so your R is not a good lead. Yeah, exactly. So in this case, both hydride and carbon are terrible leaving groups. 
once you put them on, they do not want to fall off. Versus adding an alcohol in, you add an alcohol in, when you kick it, kick it off, it's an alkoxy group. It's reasonable, right? A uh, carbon-based nucleophile is completely irreversible. It's a crummy leaving group. And then last but not least, we add in some sort of proton source. And we can get this reaction to stop. And really, this is the only way we know of of making tertiary alcohols besides SN1 chemistry. If you want to review this anymore, this is in section 13.6. We're not going to spend too much time on Grignard review. There are some other carbon-based nucleophiles. These are called cyanohydrins. And let's say we've got a ketone again. And my goal is to get to an alcohol with this nitrile group coming off. What reagent do you think I would need? Yeah, potassium cyanide. The downside with this reaction, anybody know? It could kill you, right? It's not the greatest reaction, honestly. They show this in the book, but I don't know anybody that does this chemistry. Um, it's not the most favorable reaction. And then you can imagine, too, if you really want to turn this into a good nucleophile, your first thought would be, well, let's add catalytic acid. If you add acid to the cyanide, you've got a problem. You're going to actually be creating uh, cyanide, and you could poison yourself. So this is your cyanohydrin. Typically, if you work in a lab that does this sort of chemistry, they actually make you wear a badge to monitor your exposure to cyanide. But this is a useful intermediate. You can break this down a few different ways. The first way is to react this with acid. So dilute acid and water. And when you do this, you can convert your nitrile group to a carboxylic acid. Or wait, should, do I, have, I have too many carbons. Sorry. There we go. Now that looks right. We're going to cover this reaction a lot more when we get into the carboxylic acid chapter, so we're not going to go over the mechanism right now, but nitriles are really good intermediates for getting to a carboxylic acid. So that's a nice reaction, and then you can reduce that carboxylic acid and get to a diol. Or what you can do is you can reduce your nitrile group using lithium aluminum hydride followed by water. And that will give you an amine. So the carboxylic acid chapter that we're going to cover in a few weeks goes over a lot of these reactions in more detail. But I did want to show you guys this um, reaction because the intermediate is similar to the chemistry we've been seeing. All right. Now, arguably, the most powerful carbon nucleophile is completely different than these two. And it's a lot more gentle. This is called the Wittig reaction. So for the Wittig reaction, you need an aldehyde or a ketone as your starting material. It doesn't really matter which one. So let's make a note. Then what you're going to do is you're going to react this with something called an illid. So it's, sorry, let me clean this up. This is a triphenyl group, so three benzene rings, essentially, attached to a carbon. 
or sorry, attached to a phosphorus that's attached to a carbon. And in this example, I'm going to label this as R and R. And this carbon's negative and the phosphorus is positive. So triphenylphosphine is really common in organic chemistry, especially once you get into inorganic chemistry and organometallic chemistry. When you do this, the oxygen is going to be replaced with that carbon group. And you end up forming an alkene from a carbonyl. And normally, it's a Z alkene. However, there are reactions where you can favor E over Z. And occasionally, you do get a mixture of diastereomers out of this reaction. So let's take a look at how we prepare the illid. And it's spelled with a Y. It sounds kind of weird. <coughs> and we're going to first start with triphenylphosphine. And there's a lone pair on it. And the first step, all you need to do is react this with an alkyl halide. And I'm just going to make this an X. I'm going to put an R group down here too. The main thing to note with this reaction is that it's an SN2 reaction, which means your backside has to be accessible, right? This doesn't work very well for higher level alkyl halides. So primary and methyl alkyl halides only. Did we just do a secondary though? Oh, in the example up here? Yeah. yeah, let's change one to an R just, or to an H, just so we're being consistent. Sorry, those R groups I was just trying to put as generic. Okay, so we've got this SN2 type chemistry where this phosphorus does our backside attack. We kick off our leaving group. And we're almost there. And at this point, we've got our phosphorus that's a positive charge, and we've got our leaving group back here, right? Makes sense? And then in the next step, we need to deprotonate. So what we're going to use is a really, really strong base. It is not easy to deprotonate a CH bond, right? And the easiest reagent that's commercially available just about anywhere is butyl lithium. Usually people just abbreviate this B-U-L-I. And this is an excellent base. You can also use um, things like um, LDA or another strong base. However, usually in the book you see butyl lithium. I think it's just because it's cheap, easy, and relatively safe to handle. At this step, you're going to just pluck off this proton. And you're set and you're ready to go. Let's keep this blue. So normally you make this, this reagent as you need it. But the neat thing with this reagent is that it's got some resonance stabilization. It looks pretty unstable, but it is as Witter ion. So what's this Witter ion? Yeah, it just has a resonance 
Oh, this waiter ion means it has both a positive and negative charge. Oh, yeah. But it's neutral, right? But it has a net zero charge, exactly. So it exists kind of in two forms. This one's called the illid, and then this is called the phosphorine. You can show it either way. So you may see reactions where they show it in the illid form where it's witter ionic, and you may see it shown with the double bond between phosphorus and carbon. I'm fine with either. Normally, I show the illid so you can see that negative charge. So that way we know that carbon's the nucleophile. So let's see the overall mechanism. This one gets kind of funky. Okay, so we've got our ketone. I'm just gonna use acetone for simplicity's sake. And we've got our illid down here. I'm just going to abbreviate everything, save space and time. And we've got this R group coming off right here. What do you think intuitively the first step is going to be? Carbonyl. Yeah, attack the carbon on the carbonyl and kick up electrons. That's a super strong nucleophile. It looks like a Grignard reagent. It's got a carbon with a negative charge. OK, so now we've got this oxygen up here with the negative charge. We've got this carbon right here. And I'm just gonna draw in our hydrogen and our R. And up here, whoops, we've got our phosphorus. And I'm gonna draw in all three of our um, phenyl groups. So pH, pH, pH. And this phosphorus still has a negative charge. Oh, or sorry, positive charge. So the oxygen's really, really close to the phosphorus. The phosphorus is electron poor. Next step is just going to be this oxygen attacking the phosphorus. This intermediate, though, where you've got the negative and positive is this weirder ion with a special name called a betaene. And this reaction always kind of bothered me as an undergrad. So I was like, this looks like the least happy ring imaginable. But it does occur. I don't believe you. <laughs> well, you have to. I'm kidding. You don't have to. <laughs> and I'll explain why this reaction proceeds in the forward direction in a second. But you can kind of think of this step being somewhat reversible, right? So. Just for the sake of argument, let's make this a reversible arrow. But the net reaction is only a one-way arrow, and I'll show you why. So in this next step, this bond is going to hop over there, forming a new oxygen-phosphorus double bond. And then this bond is going to hop down. When you do this, now you've got this alkene on the bottom where this R group is hanging off and a hydrogen's hanging off. And there we go. We've made our new alkene. And we made triphenylphosphine oxide. This four-membered ring intermediate that we went through is called an oxophosphatane. So if you ever want to win at Scrabble, you can throw that down. <laughs> that long. But the main driving force of this reaction is the formation of this triphenylphosphine oxide. It is a huge thermodynamic sink. Once you make it, it is not going in the reverse direction. Nope. 
Makes the overall reaction irreversible. The bummer with this from a practical standpoint is triphenylphosphine oxide is really hard to remove. Um, you can imagine on NMR, if you have even a small amount of it in there, and you look in your six to seven region, all you see is this hairy beard area. So if you've got even a smidge of it in there and you show an NMR to somebody, they'll say this is impure. Normally you can kind of hide impurities a little bit, but not with triphenylphosphine oxide. In graduate school, I remember purifying things four times in a row to get rid of any trace amounts of triphenylphosphine oxide. It's a pain in the butt. Um, there are some other methods that are variants of this to avoid the pain up of cleaning it all up, but it is a really useful reaction to convert a carbonyl to an alkene. And then we've opened up that chapter nine um, set of reactions for us where we can add um, alcohols, we can add halogens, we can do all sorts of stuff to that alkene. So this is one of the most useful transformations uh, in this chapter. So let's take an example and I'll show you guys how to work backwards with this. We'll do working backwards. Okay, so let's say I'm a chemist and I'm being told by my boss that I need to make this. The question is, how can I make this using a Wittig reaction? We've got a couple different ways. So normally, what I would do is I'd say, all right, we can make this from a ketone or aldehyde, right? So let's break this apart and we'll pick two different routes. So option one is let's make this guy on the left be our aldehyde, right? So if we have that, that means we've got this starting aldehyde. What would our Wittig reagent need to be? Try to figure out what reagent you would want to plug in there. Really, we're trying to add in this green portion, so make sure you don't add or subtract carbons. We want this carbon to be the nucleophile, so it's got to have that negative charge on there for our illid. We know it's got to have phosphorus on there, and the triphenylphosphine is attached to that carbon. So we could throw in this combo of reagents, right? What's the other way we could do it? Give you guys a minute to come up with the opposite route, but there is an alternative. And then give me a thumbs up if you think you got the alternate route too. We'll try to keep the green ring on the right and the blue ring on the left here. So if, if this guy up here is the aldehyde and we want to change the route, that means that the green ring must have been something with the carbonyl, right? Can it be an aldehyde? No, it's got to be a ketone. Okay, so we could have the green ring be our ketone. And then we've got to identify what illid we would need to attach all of the blue carbons. So we've got this ring. We've got this carbon here. This carbon here must have had a negative charge on it, right? in order for it to be the nucleophile. And then the phosphorus 
Must have been attached to that carbon. So really either of these would work. Which one do you think is the better route and why? And then explain that to your neighbor. The other weird thing is there's actually two explanations, but they both lead to the same answer. And then give me a thumbs up if you think you've got a rationale. All right, so let's let's check in. All right, first thing, as a chemist, I have to make my illid. Which one's easier to make? Is this illid easier to make, or is this one, top or bottom, and why? So if you remember, in order to make it, it's an SN2 reaction, right? where your phosphorus is acting as a nucleophile kicking off a leaving group. Mm -hmm. So in order for this to proceed easily, you have to follow the same rules for SN2 chemistry. Your alkyl halide should be methyl or primary carbon, right? That means that this one right here is the primary carbon. If we look over here, it's a secondary carbon. So using that intuition, I would say, you know what? This one right here is going to be a heck of a lot easier to make. It uses a primary alkyl halide. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is a little bit more subtle, but equally important. If I want to have this carbon be a nucleophile, a good nucleophile is something that's less hindered, right? If we look at this top one in green, that nucleophile is pretty dang hindered. It's got a lot of stuff hanging off of it. Where the one in blue that I've circled is a lot less hindered, which means it's the better nucleophile. So this is kind of a two-in-one. Both of those things are playing in your favor. That means that this reaction down here is going to be a lot easier to perform, and ideally this would be the only way that you would want to do it. And we'll make a less hindered, more nucleophilic note. Does that make sense? So when you're doing retrosynthesis, try to do that thought process. There's more than one way to do these Wittig reactions, but one way is usually better than the other. Usually the group you're attaching on is going to be the um, less substituted carbon. All right, so let's do a little bit of practice.
So a synthesis problem. So let's make this compound using cyclohexane and alcohols with four carbons or fewer. And any other inorganic reagents you want. Phosphorus being inorganic. <laughs> All right, give me a thumbs up if you guys think you got it. Let's work backwards slowly in case you're stuck. So first thing I would do is Wittig reaction, right? This looks just like the problem we saw, so let's piece this together. All right, we know that the cyclohexane must have been a ketone because that's our more sterically hindered ketone. That means that our illid... must have consisted of this guy, so two carbons were added on. Make sure you count your carbons. And in this case, I'm not gonna show the hydrogens, but we've got this. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to figure out how did we make this illid? Well, no, this one right here. We need an alkyl halide, right? What would our alkyl halide be? Bromoethane. Yeah, like bromoethane, for example. Okay. So step one in this reaction is triphenylphosphine. Oop. And then what was the base we used for step two? BULI, butyl lithium. Okay. So that would get you to your illid. All right. How can we make... Bromoethane from ethanol. Oh, uh, the PBR3? PBR3, another older reaction. A long time ago. Or you could really slam this with HBR. That would work too. Um, however, PBR3 is a lot better for usually converting alcohols to um, bromines. HBr is just such a strong acid. If you have any sort of acid functional group or acid sensitive functional group, it'll mess with it. So we'll do PBr3. All right, I think we're on track. We've got this as one starting material. Now let's work backwards. How can we make this ketone? Yeah, we could oxidize an alcohol. So cyclohexanol. Okay, what oxidant do we want to use? We could use PCC. You can use chromic acid, doesn't matter. Um, both of them have chromium. They're both environmentally unfriendly, so it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> All right, you'll notice in your book too, they often sometimes say CH2, Cl2. Why do they have that in there? Common solvent. Common solvent, that's all it is. Don't worry if you don't have it. All right, how can we make this? So we could have cyclohexene or we could ring open an epoxide. Let's just start with cyclohexene. All right, how can we go from cyclohexene to cyclohexanol? Acid catalyzed hydration. Acid catalyzed hydration, right? So this goes all the way back to January where we said we can have H, actually, sorry, let's do H plus H2O, and we want this to be in excess, right? We know we can do the reverse reaction if we have catalytic acid and heat, and then we drive off the water, but if we want to put the water back on, we want excess water. Okay, and then the question is, well, how can we get here from cyclohexane? Elimination, okay. So let's say we have a halogen on here. What would a good base be? NaH. NaH. And then how can we do this? What reagent would we need? UV and Br2. Yeah, UV, UV and Br2. MBS works well for benzylic bromination and allylic bromination, but elemental bromine plus UV light could get us from cyclohexane to um, uh, bromocyclohexane. So I know synthesis can get tough, but like I said, try to review in a group and go through a lot of the integrated problems in the book in particular. I think tomorrow I'm going to pull together a bunch of practice problems that we can work on in class too.